global warming. I don't think this is as important a problem as other people do. Just so we put on record what exactly you believed and said, yeah, rather than what it's, we it's think you what, said. What, what people are saying is really not true, even though at the end of that book I thought, well, people aren't going to understand this, so I'll write it in simple declarative sentences and still people misstate it. What I said was, the Earth is definitely getting warm. It's gotten, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven tenths of a degree Celsius warmer in the last hundred years. We are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's increased 30% in the last century. We're, um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We would expect a 30% increase to have some influence on temperature. We're also doing lots of other things that, that affect the, the temperature as it's measured in a, in a global temperature reading. So we're, you know, cutting down the forests and doing croplands and all that. What's, what's basically called land use changes, or the urban heat island effect also, has an effect whether that's compensated for adequately in the way they do these calculations or not. And I said, my conclusion is that we will have a tenth of a degree warming increase in the next hundred years. So I absolutely believe that warming is occurring, humans are involved, and it's going to continue for the next hundred years. Then what did you say that got everybody so upset at you? I'm not a catastrophist. And oh, I said one other thing too. I said, I think it is not likely that carbon dioxide is going to prove to be the primary driver. What do you think will be the primary driver? I think the sun, and I think there are miscalculations from urban land use, generally speaking. Okay, now, you know, and I'm sure you read every sentence of this new report by the UN that came out of Paris. Mm. Yes? I, I haven't, actually, because I don't read the summary for policymakers. <coughs> I, wonder, I read what the scientists say, not what the politicians say. Mm. Tell me if I'm wrong. Every good scientist that I talk says to me, 90% of the scientists agree on this. Most of the scientists say, we all agree on this, you know, that it is catastrophic. Tell me what's wrong about this. Oh, I know, you're bored by this or what? Well, it's, it's um, a lot of the people who talk about it, and I don't, I don't know who you're thinking of specifically, don't actually know very much. And, and I'm sympathetic to that, because for a long time I said, oh yes, carbon, you know, global warming, it's a terrible problem, blah, blah, blah. And only when I went and looked at the figures, I thought, wait a minute. Tell me again why this is a catastrophe. I see that it's something that's happening. I see that it's important. If you talk to Jesse Osabel at Rockefeller University, he'll tell you we've been decarbonizing since the days of Abraham Lincoln and Queen Elizabeth, and we're going to continue to decarbonize. So whether or not we're, this is going to happen fast enough for some people, it's a long-term 150-year trend. It's going to continue. You can't get agreement on almost anything, as far as I can tell. I mean, you can, you can bring in five guys to talk about whether Antarctica, core of Antarctica, is getting colder or not. Everybody agrees the peninsula, which is 2% of the mass, is getting warmer. And, you know, they'll argue and argue and argue, and you'll come away after an hour saying, I don't know what the answer is, and that's the reality. Nobody really knows that. But what I said in my book, and I think, and I defy anybody telling me I'm wrong, is I said nobody knows how fast it's going to get warmer, and nobody knows for sure what the various contributions of warming are. And I've predicted eight-tenths of a degree, and nobody knows that I'm wrong. And nothing has happened since you wrote that book to change your mind about your conclusions. No. And what I do, you know, I've had really, I went to Germany in, in 05, and, and it was a very hostile environment, and I, and I gave a speech which consisted only of what was then the, the latest UN document, the third assessment report, and I put these graphs up, and I said to them, look, this is what they're saying, is this okay with you? The audience got phenomenally silent. Because if you really start to say, okay, how do you validate the models? How is it done? Oh, we do it. Um, there's a uh, personal component of assessment. Well, really? You know, well, that's not okay for a drug. That's not, it's not okay for the maker to, to self-validate. We don't believe that. We don't think that's acceptable. It has to be done by somebody outside. We're talking about, if you listen to Bjorn Lundberg, $558 trillion globally to make this change. I think it's a, a good change to make. I think we will make it naturally. I think there's a lot of reasons to make it. I'm in favor of making it. The question is whether we should do it as a crash program. 
for $558 trillion. And the notion of spending that money without really validating the bejesus out of the data is very bizarre to me. Based on your reading the data, you think, yes, we're getting warmer, but it's not going to lead to the catastrophe. That's what you've just right. said. Right. You know, do you have a reason that that's not the common perception? I think the answer is that whenever you have something that's untied to the data, and when you have people adopting essentially philosophical positions, emotional positions, which the environment tremendously invites, um, how I feel as I walk through the woods and how I feel as I see clear-cutting or something like that, um, very often from people who really don't understand these issues at all, then it's a very easy thing for an attitude to move in the direction of increasing demand or in increasing hysteria or increasing concern, whether or not that's appropriate or not. Al Gore. Now he's made a movie. Yes. Inconvenient Truth. Yes. And you say about what he says in that movie, what? If I wanted to make a movie that said that, said what he said, I could make a much better movie. There are a lot of things in that movie that are dicey. What there is in that movie that's not dicey, but wrong. Okay. Kilimanjaro, as an example of global warming, is wrong. 20-foot increase in sea levels or 40-foot increases, whatever it is now, is wrong. And, and I think, actually, attitudinally, it's wrong. I think that, you know, the notion that this is a, that this is a spiritual or religious issue for us is wrong. It is a scientific matter that we need to look at with as dispassionate a way of seeing it as possible. If we don't do that, we're just expressing rank prejudices. As so Al Gore's movie and book express rank prejudices. That's my view, sure. I mean, he's, he's making arguments, I, mean, I love the guy, he's making arguments that, for which there is no data. There just isn't. And he's got these fabulous pictures of, of the United States being inundated and, you know, and I had somebody call me up who'd seen it and say, wow, you know, I know you live at the beach sometimes and I have a beach house and, you know, kiss them goodbye. I don't think so. I talked to two people, both very eminent, um, when I was working on the book and both, you know, they both attacked me subsequently. Um, because they were the leading people thinking about this, and I went to them and said, these are my problems. And I didn't get good answers back. But Charlie, the, the, the shortest version of this that I have is, I said, okay, we've had half a degree or six-tenths of a degree, it's not a crisis. What is everyone upset about? And the answer is, we're upset about the future. How do you know, because I believe the future is unknowable, how do you know what this is going to be? And their answer is, we have a computer model of global climate. And I say, climate, according to the last UN report, is a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system. And they say, long-term prediction of climate is not possible. That's what they say. Direct quote. So, I'm saying, I don't think that a computer model cuts it. I'm not having it. Think about what I've done here in this conversation. I said, tell me exactly what it is you believe and why you believe it, and what do you say to those people who, who have a different opinion? And you said they haven't looked at the data those, as well as I have, and understand what I'm Most saying. Most people saying, I know haven't looked yeah. at the data at all. And you think that the reason it's gotten such, I mean, it is now, in the opinion of many, has reached a critical mass, this judgment that it's more severe than right. you think it is, right. is because it has a certain what, certain... Why does it have such currency? Oh, first of all, people are... What is the way about America works? And always, it's currency? not America, it's human beings. They line up for the catastrophe. They're ready for it. They're ready for overpopulation. They're ready for resource depletion. They're ready for whatever it is. They're, we're ready for bird flu. I mean, you know, it's going to wipe well, us bird flu is not a problem either? It's a potential problem. Could be a very serious problem. Yes, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, people are, are they're ready. They're excited. They're excited about mad cow. But I think it's far, for example, I've done this as a sort of test. You sit down at a dinner party and you say, the world is coming to an end. We have the most horrible things in about, and you get immediately the aroused attention to the table. Alternatively, you say, you know what? Basically, everything's good. Well, the world's getting better. Nobody cares. No, they get, they get angry or they turn away. It's not what we want to hear. We want to hear disaster. 
I'm often asked the question in the U.S., which is everyone disagrees with you. And it's actually something that um, Einstein was asked. What, about relativity or what? No, I mean, he was... <laughs> when, uh, no one agrees with me. At a certain point, um, the, the Nazis had made this book of, uh, because it was Jewish science, and, and 200 scientists had said that Einstein was wrong about relativity. Mm. And somebody asked Einstein, what do, you, what do you think there are 200 people that say you're wrong? And he said, all it takes is one person to prove me wrong. You see, consensus science is not science. Consen all this consensus stuff is about politics. The real question is what is about the science. And that's why, you know, I said, for example, if you've got a good model, run it out okay, 10 years and let's see you show it. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't think anybody's saying this is going to happen in 10 years, so. No, but I'm saying if your model is good for 100 years, let's see it run for 10. Okay. Tell me what the temperature is. Suppose they would, would turn around and say, okay, Michael, you prove we're wrong. Would you prove they're wrong in your judgment? No, no one can prove it wrong. We're talking about what the future is. No one knows what the future is. Charlie, I have to tell you, if there's anything that's so weird for me, yes. it's this. That you, that you can talk to scientists and you say, what do you think of that shop corner with a neon sign that says psychic reading and somebody's going to tell you the future? They go, oh, that's a fraud. That's a charlatan. No one can do that. You go, great. What do you think about the, telling me what the global temperature of the climate, I predict the climate, no one can predict the weather for a month, the climate, a hundred years from now, and they go, oh, that's, that's science. That's important. Pay $500 million for that, a billion dollars. I mean, it's bizarre to me. No one can predict the future. The guy that I think you ought to get on this show is a guy named Reed Bryson, who was the leading climatologist of the 1970s and became very heavily committed in global cooling, predicted millions dead and so on. He's still around. He's still writing and commenting. And I think he's had the experience of having made a mistake. And if I'm right, then there's going to be enormously fascinating history because there's a whole band of intelligentsia and a whole band of scientists that... I'm going to turn out to have made a significant major mistake. I actually look at it in terms of where we're going. I mean, is if this doesn't work out, then science itself is going to be enormously injured. Are we, as Western societies, moving away from science? Are we having less and less interest in verified data? I mean, I, I start talking about verified data, and people kind of mm, they seem uninterested in that. They seem uninterested in having real certainty about things and more interested in this sort of cohesiveness and consensus idea. Maybe we're moving in some other direction. You stated in your remarks to the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco that one of the most powerful religions in the Western world is environmentalism. Can you explain why you refer to environmentalism as a religion? Because I have trained in anthropology. The idea that anthropologists have about what constitutes a religion or what functions a religion serves are a little bit different from how you think about it if you categorize religions as, you know, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, something like that. So from the standpoint of an anthropological view, a religion is a collective set of beliefs. Um, it ha there is a leader or leaders who promote the beliefs among the followers. Followers make some kind of contribution or uh, change in uh, their lifestyle based on the religious belief. Uh, the religious belief gives them a total view of the world in terms of what, how the world is structured, what's right, what's wrong, what's good action, what's bad action. That all fits perfectly onto environmentalism. The other thing that environmentalism does, which I said to this group, is that it rather precisely maps a lot of Judeo-Christian beliefs about the origin of the world and so on, so that in environmental thinking, there is a view that it, there used to be a sort of Eden, and then people came and ruined that, that Eden, and that we are therefore sort of original sinners because we're destroying this planet, and what we can do, however, is get salvation through sustainability. And if you're a good person, you will seek salvation, and if you're a bad person, you'll drive SUVs. Um, <laughs> That is a kind of a religious belief. That was my argument. It a fear you were very negative towards environmentalism. What caused you to be so prejudiced towards this religion? I don't think it should be a religion. 
I don't know. It's interesting that you say it was prejudice. That um, it's a disagreement. I'm not sure it's a. I, I would argue it's not a prejudice. That it's a different way of seeing things. What I the core of my argument is that if you're going to be responsive to the environment, the environment is always changing, and our understanding of the environment is always changing. If we are to be to do better with the environment that we do now, and I would tell you that at this moment. We have raw sewage seeping out of the Yellowstone National Park. So we're not doing a great job. I, I mention the parks because the parks are unlike uh, land use where there's conflicts about should we build a house or should we build. The, the parks are set aside. The parks are there for us to preserve them. And it turns out we don't know how to preserve them. And we won't admit that we don't know how to preserve them. We have, it's been a disaster what we've done. And so, when I look at how we treat the environment, I think we have to be flexible. I think we have to try things and see how they turn out. We have to be ready to change course. We have to be able to adapt. We have to say we're wrong and let's do it right. We have to do research. This is all stuff that fundamentalist religions can't do. And if, and if, the envir if environmentalism is a kind of fundamentalist religion, then that's not a good way to manage the environment. We need a scientific approach. We need a non-religious approach. We need a way to look at this and do better than we've done. A lot better. It's essential. It's essential for you guys and, you know, for your children. Particularly, I would like to try and direct our attention to the notion that most people make the assumption of linearity in a world that is largely non-linear. I hope that at the end of this talk, the meaning of that statement will be clear, but we won't be getting there in a linear fashion. Some of you know that I've written a book that many people find controversial called State of Fear. And I want to tell you how I came to write it. Because up until about five years ago, I had very conventional ideas about the environment and the environmental movement. This book really began, is that mine? This book really began in 1998, when I had decided to write a novel about a global disaster. That was one of the first books I'd written, and I thought, well, I'm old now, I'll write another one. And in the course of my preparation for this book, I rather casually reviewed what had happened at Chernobyl, because I regard Chernobyl as the largest man-made disaster that I knew about. What I discovered stunned me. Chernobyl was a tragic event, but nothing remotely close to the global catastrophe that I was imagining. About 50 people had died in Chernobyl, roughly the number of Americans that die every day in traffic accidents. I don't mean to be gruesome, uh, but it was a setback for me. You can't write a novel about a global disaster in which only 50 people die. I was, I was undaunted. I began to research other kinds of disasters that might fill, fulfill my novelistic requirements. And that's when I began to realize how big our planet really is and how resilient its systems ordinarily seem to be. Even though I wanted to create a fictional catastrophe of global proportions, I found it hard to come up with a credible example. I couldn't actually come up with anything that I would believe. So in the end, I set the book aside and wrote something else. But the shock that I had experienced reverberated in me for a while, because what I'd been led to believe about Chernobyl was not merely wrong, it was astonishingly wrong. Let's review that for a minute. These are the low estimates of, of immediate Chernobyl deaths uh, as a consequence of the actual incident. And you see here the UPI in, in 1986, at the time of the disaster, predicted that there would be 2,000 immediate deaths. The New York Post thought there would be 16,000. The Canadian Broadcasting Company in 91 thought there would be that many. And you see the BBC and uh, the New York Times in 2002 predicting at the low end 15,000 deaths. Their, their estimates were 15,000 to 30,000 deaths. Now there was a UN commission in 2000 that suggested that, there, that the catastrophe was nowhere near that proportion. And as you can see, the next UN Commission in 2005 doesn't really show up on the graph because the total numbers are 56. To report that 15 to 30,000 people are dead when the actual number is 56 represents a very large error. 
To get some idea of just how big, let's imagine that we lined all the victims up in a row. If 56 people are each represented by one foot of, of space, then that's probably the distance for me to about the second table here, something like that. 15,000 people is three miles away. It seems difficult to make a mistake of that scale. But of course, you're probably thinking, we're talking about radiation, but about long-term consequences. Unfortunately for the media, their reports are even less accurate here. Here you see uh, CNN in 1996 was predicting future uh, Chernobyl-related illnesses and death in a large swath that would go from Sweden to the Baltic, um, to the Black Sea, uh, estimating three and a half million. The BBC, much more conservatively, estimated 50,000. Agence Press thought half a million. Um, the Ukrainian Victims Group in 2002 estimated 150,000. Um, the UN Commission in 2005 decided that there would be about 4,000. That's the number of Americans who die of adverse drug reactions in this country every six weeks. Again, a huge error. But most troubling of all, according to the UN report, was that the largest public health problem created by the accident was the damaging psychological impact due to a lack of accurate information. This was manifesting as, they said, as negative self-assessments of health, belief in a shortened life expectancy, lack of initiative, and dependency on assistance from the state. In other words, the greatest damage to the people of Chernobyl was caused by bad information. These people weren't blighted by radiation so much as by terrifying but false information. We ought to ponder for a minute exactly what that implies. We demand strict controls on radiation because it's such a health hazard. But clearly, Chernobyl suggests that false information can be a health hazard as damaging as radiation. I'm not saying that radiation is not a threat. I'm also not saying that Chernobyl is not a genuinely serious event. But thousands of Ukrainians who didn't die were made invalids out of fear. They were told to be afraid. They were told they were going to die when they weren't. They were told their children would be deformed when they weren't. They were told they couldn't have children when they could. They were authoritatively promised a future of cancer, deformities, pain, and decay. It's no wonder they responded as they did. In fact, we really need to recognize that is this kind of human response is very well documented. Authoritatively telling people they are going to die can in itself be fatal. You may know that there's an Australian Aborigine, uh, that the Aborigines fear something called pointing the bone. A shaman shakes a bone at a person, sings a song, and soon after the person dies. This is a specific example of a phenomenon generally referred to as hex death. A person is cursed by an authority figure and subsequently dies. According to medical studies, the person generally dies of dehydration, implying that they just give up. But the progression is very erratic, and shock symptoms may play a part, suggesting adrenal effects of fright and hopelessness. Yet this deadly curse is nothing but information, and it can be undone with information. A friend of mine was an intern at Bellevue Hospital in New York when a 28-year-old man from Arubus came in saying he was going to die because he'd been cursed. He was admitted for a psychiatric evaluation and found to be normal, but his health in the, steadily declined while he was in the hospital. My friend was able to rehydrate him, balance his electrolytes, and give him nutrients, but nevertheless the man worsened. He insisted that he was cursed and that nothing could be done to prevent his death. My friend realized that this patient would, in fact, soon die. The situation was desperate. Finally, he told the patient that he, the doctor, was going to invoke his own powerful medicine to undo the curse, and his medicine was more powerful than any other. He then got together with the house staff, brought some headdresses and rattles, and danced around the patient in the middle of the night, chanting what they hoped would be effective sounding phrases. I think several of them were trying to remember uh, their bar mitzvah. <laughs> The patient showed no reaction, but the next day he began to improve. He went home a few days later, and I would say that my friend literally saved his life. 
This suggests that Ukrainian invalids are not unique in their response, but the, that the large numbers of what we might call information casualties represent a particularly egregious example of what can happen from false fears. But once I looked at Chernobyl, I began to remember some other fears in my life that had also never come true. The population bomb, for one. Paul Ehrlich predicted mass starvation in the 1960s. 60 million Americans starving to death, that didn't happen. Other scientists warned of mass species extinctions by the year 2000. Ehrlich himself predicted that half of all species would become extinct by 2000. That didn't happen. The Club of Rome told us we would run out of raw materials ranging from oil to copper by the 1990s. That didn't happen either. It's no surprise that predictions frequently don't come true, but such big ones, and so many. All my life, I worried about the decay of the environment, the tragic loss of species, the collapse of ecosystems. I worried a lot. Poisoned by pesticides, alar and apples, falling sperm counts from endocrine disruptors, cancer from power lines, cancer from saccharin, cancer from cell phones, cancer from computer screens, cancer from food coloring, hairspray, electric razors, electric blankets, coffee, chlorinated water. It never seemed to end. Only once, when on the same day I read that beer was a preservative of heart muscle and also a carcinogen, <laughs> did I begin to realize the bind that I was in. Chernobyl started me on a new path. When I began to research these old fears to find out what had been said in the past, I discovered several important things. The first is that there's nothing more sobering than a 30-year-old newspaper. You can't figure out what the headlines mean. You don't know who the people are. Theodore Green, John Sparkman, George Reedy, Jack Watson, who were they? You thumb through page after page of vanished concerns, issues that apparently were important at the time and now don't matter at all. It's amazing how many pressing concerns are literally of the moment. They won't matter in six months, and certainly not in six years. And if they won't matter then, are they really worth our attention now? But as David Brinkley once said, the one function TV news performs very well is that when there is no news, we give it to you with the same emphasis as if there were. <laughs> uh, we, we miss him. I think we... The second thing I discovered was that attempts to provoke fear tended to employ a certain kind of stereotypic and very intense language. For example, here's a quote, quote on climate. We simply cannot afford to gamble by ignoring it. We cannot risk inaction. Those scientists who say we are merely entering a period of climate instability are acting irresponsibly. The indications are that our climate can soon change for the worse are too strong to be reasonably ignored. Familiar language, isn't it? But this is not actually about global warming. It's about global cooling. <laughs> Fear of a new ice age. Is anybody here worried about an ice age? <laughs> Is anybody upset that we didn't act now, back then, <laughs> to stockpile food and all the other things we were warned that we had to do? Here's a quote from a famous computer study in the 1970s that predicted a dire future for mankind unless we act now. And just notice the language here. We're unanimously convinced that rapid, radical redressment of the present unbalanced and dangerously deteriorating world situation is the primary task facing mankind. Concerted international measures and joint long-term planning will be necessary on a scale and scope without precedent. This is supreme effort is founded on a basic change of values and goals at individual, national, and world levels. Very heavy stuff. Here's Paul Ehrlich talking about um, what he thinks uh, we're going to have to do. He's talking about population. As you know, he, uh, he, thought he favored voluntary controls, but if voluntary controls didn't work, he favored coercive controls. He said, the operation will demand many apparently brutal and heartless decisions. The pain may be intense, but the disease is so far advanced that only with radical surgery does a patient have a chance of survival. Ah, here's the UN. 
This is about Y2K. History offers no example of a parallel threat on a global, national, or local scale. To wait and see invites disaster. A worldwide strategic mobilization similar to the effort required by World War II must be developed in the weeks ahead. Now, nearly everybody's forgotten about Y2K, so let me remind you of what was predicted six years ago. Here's one author who said um, he was assuming at least a 12-month disruption of basic goods and services, including no electrical power, no clean water, no telecommunications, shortages of food, gas, clothing, and retail goods, bank failures, inaccessibility of funds, stock market crash, dramatic drop in real estate prices. We're still waiting for that. <laughs> Economic depression, unemployment, civil unrest, including protests, riots, and general lawlessness. This is actually one of the milder predictions. Here's another one who, here's another prediction that simply pointed to a meltdown of civilization as we know it. <laughs> Can't get any stronger than that. But what actually happened? Essentially nothing. And the UN was pleased. During the first months of the new century, only minor problems were reported. The governments can congratulate themselves for passing the Y2K challenge. Yeah. Now, there's only one problem. The, the governments didn't really have anything to do with it. And you may think, well, wait a minute, Y2K was a real problem, and the concerns, even if they were exaggerated, nevertheless mobilized people and led them to success. This is a common but entirely erroneous view. The government, it's easily demonstrated here. The United States government on Y2K spent $6 billion. Citibank alone spent nearly $1 billion. And total U.S. expenditures were in the region of $100 billion, which means the government spent 6% of the total. Globally, as you can see, there were, uh, there were 200 billion in expenditures. So you see something like this. And so here's the United States government, and we are asked to imagine that it is responsible for saving us from this crisis. Would Citibank have spent the money to fix its Y2K problem without government urging? Of course, because not to do so would have put them out of business. And the same with other banks and businesses around the world, yet government takes credit. To encourage what is happening anyway is a common strategy in many areas of advocacy. For example, it now seems clear that despite the warnings of Paul Ehrlich and others, we are not going to have a population explosion of 14 billion people and accompanying mass starvation. How did we avoid this explosion? Because, the head of Planned Parenthood once explained to me, everybody in the world listened to Ehrlich and got busy stopping population growth. <laughs> I could see in my mind Yemeni tribesmen, you know, <laughs> finding a copy of the book. But, but the major, the most significant point is I was really astonished that she was so ill-informed about her subject area. Because Ehrlich may be a celebrity in the West, but his advocacy had little to do with solving the problem of the population because that problem was already being solved by itself at the time he wrote the book. Here's a graph from the World Bank. It's not very easy to understand, but it's the World Bank. And if we look here at where Ehrlich's book appeared, you see that, um, that uh, the, uh, it's hard for me to follow, it. anyway, the, the birth rate was in developed countries was falling for about 100 years at that point. And uh, in the developing nations, it had been falling, falling for close to a decade. Ehrlich was thus urging people to do what they had already been doing for some time. And it's not clear to me whether he knew that or not, but certainly when he said, the battle to feed all humanity is over, at this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate, then he's simply wrong. You can see the death rate here for the developed countries and the death rate here for the developing countries, and as you see, nothing, it never went up. Ehrlich's message, crying out in desperation to urge what's already happening, is not unique. We have a contemporary example of the call in, uh, by politicians and activists to end our dependence on fossil fuels and move to a carbon neutral lifestyle. Their call to action is, however, a little bit late. According to Jesse Austabel, the Rockefeller Institute, the industrialized nations have been decarbonizing their energy sources for 150 years. 
meaning that we are moving away from carbon toward hydrogen. In other words, the ratio of carbon to hydrogen uh, decreases as you go from wood and hay, which is one to one, to coal, to oil, and finally to natural gas, where it's one to four. Here's an illustration from one of Osterbell's articles. The, uh, the blue um, atoms are hydrogen, and the dirty brown ones are <laughs> carbon. <laughs> and you can see, as we go from coal to oil to gas, natural gas, there's still any for sale, um, we are increasing the, the proportion of hydrogen to carbon. Osterbell expects this trend will continue through this century as we move toward what he imagines as a pure hydrogen energy system without the assistance of lawyers and activists. Obviously, if a trend has been continuously operating since the days of Lincoln and Queen Victoria, it probably does not need the assistance of organizations like the Sierra Club and the NRDC, which are showing up about 100 years too late. Osterwald's ideas are controversial to some, but not to sites like Sustainability Now. And this is again showing you the ratio of, of hydrogen and pure clean blue to carbon and other various sources. All right. So in summary, when I went back to look at old fears, the first thing I found was that newspapers were largely empty. The second thing I found was that the language was uniformly and excessively frightening. And the third thing I found was that a lot of advocacy was encouraging what was happening anyway. But I learned some other things too. One interesting feature is the tendency toward reversals. A benefit becomes a hazard and then becomes a benefit again. Butter is good, then it's bad, then it's good. Saccharin is good, then it's bad, then it's good again. But this is also true for some much larger scares like cancer and power lines, which hit the media in 1989. Before 1989, there were books like this, which saw magnetic fields as necessary for life. Then in 1989, <laughs> Paul Broder's articles in the New Yorker magazine, a source of erroneous scientific information for many decades, and his strong position brought, brought people that agreed with him. Here's a consumer's guide to the issues of electromagnetic fields and how to protect ourselves. But then a funny thing happened. After about a decade, magnetic fields were rehabilitated. And you can chart that progression here. This is 1997, 1998, 2000, 2001. Now it's getting sexy. <laughs> And finally, it's kind of um, new agey. Now, the end stage of this process is something like this. Here, here is an ad that says that, that tells you um, that you need to get this magnetism that is, exists in the Earth. But since nature is drastically depleted, this environmental subcoordinate is incredibly important and they will sell you magnets to increase your supply of it. Now we see we've completed the circle from fear to selling point, from magnetic fields that are too powerful for health to fields that are too weak for health. Of course, rather than buying these magnets, you could just stand alongside a power line. <laughs> or sit with your back to a TV set. <laughs> Snuggle up to a kitchen appliance. There's lots of ways to increase your exposure to healthful magnetic fields. <laughs> I'm reviewing these past fears not to make fun of them, but because I think this back and forth quality, that's the fears that suddenly rise and subside, is symptomatic of a deeper problem with modern environmental thinking, a problem that we have to fix. But meanwhile, the fears do continue to rise and fall. Let's look at some graphs of past fears. To get a rough idea of the visibility of fears, I did a word search on Nexus for two newspapers, the Washington Post and the New York Times. These provide very rough measures, but they'll show you a trend. Here's the graph for power lines and cancer. 
As you can see, uh, not much interest, a peak following Broder's book, a decline here, which I think is people sensibly saying, wait a minute, and then the thing has its own momentum and slowly declines as the whole thesis unravels. Cost of this thing is about $25 billion, start to finish. A similar sort of pattern we have for the population explosion. This may be a little hard to see, but we can run a five-year average of, this is articles that appeared in the New York Times, and you can see finally we are in serious decline. If this were a stock, <laughs> sell it. <laughs> and finally, here is a much sharper peak for Y2K. <laughs> As you see, a sudden spike, two articles a day in the Washington Post in 1999, and then it collapsed to almost nothing. This later drift upward appears to have two causes. First, there's a band called Y2K. And second, there's a steady trickle of self-congratulatory articles in which people say it's wonderful that we stopped the dreaded crisis in time. But I only want to emphasize the pattern. New fears rising and falling to be replaced by others that rise and fall. As Mark Twain said, I've seen a heap of trouble in my life and most of it never came to pass. But I've suggested that this pattern is in itself indicative of a problem in how we approach the environment. And I'd like to talk about that now. Environmental disputes frequently revolve around conflicts of land use triggered by fears. The spotted owl is endangered, and that means logging in the Northwest must stop. People are put out of work, communities suffer. It may be in 10 or 30 years that we discover that logging was not a danger to the spotted owl, or it may be that we discover it was. But my point is that the drama surrounding these disputes, angry marches, press coverage, tree hugging, bulldozers, serves to obscure the deeper problem. The deeper problem is we don't know how to manage the environment even when there's no conflict at all. As a good example of why, let's take a case history of our management of the environment, Yellowstone National Park. This is the welcome sign. Long recognized as a scene of great natural beauty, in 1872, Ulysses Grant set aside Yellowstone as the first formal nature preserve in the world. More than two million acres, larger than Delaware and Rhode Island combined. John Muir was very pleased when he visited in 1885, noting that under the care of the Department of the Interior, Yellowstone was protected from, quote, the blind, ruthless destruction that is going on in adjoining regions. Theodore Roosevelt was also pleased in 1903 when, as president, he went to Yellowstone for a dedication ceremony. Here he is. This was his third visit. Roosevelt saw a thousand antelope, plentiful cougar, mountain sheep, deer, coyote, and many thousands of elk. He wrote at that time, our people should see to it that this rich heritage is preserved for their children and their children's children forever with its majestic beauty all unmarred. But in fact, Yellowstone was not preserved. On the contrary, it was altered beyond repair in a matter of years. By 1934, the Park Service acknowledged that white-tailed deer, cougar, lynx, wolf, and possibly wolverine and fisher are gone from the Yellowstone. What they didn't say was that the Park Service was solely responsible for the disappearances. Park rangers had been shooting the animals for decades, even though that was illegal since the Lacey Act of 1894. But they thought they knew best. They thought their environmental concerns trumped any mere law. What actually happened at Yellowstone is a cascade of ego and error. But to understand it, we have to go back to the 1890s. Back then, it was believed that elk were becoming extinct, so these animals were fed and encouraged. Over the next few years, the number of elk in the park exploded. Here you see them feeding them, hand to hand. Roosevelt had seen a few thousand animals on his visit, and he'd noticed that there were, the elk were more numerous than in his previous visit. Nine years later, in 1912, there were 30,000 elk in Yellowstone. By 1914, there were 35,000. But things were going very well. Rainbow trout had also been introduced, and although they crowded out the native cutthroats, nobody really worried. Fishing was great. Bears were increasing in numbers, and moose and bison as well. 
By 1915, Roosevelt realized the elk had become a problem, and he urged scientific management, which meant culling. His advice was ignored. Instead, the Park Service did everything they could to increase the number of elk. The results were predictable. Antelope and deer began to decline. Overgrazing changed the flora. Aspen and willows were being eaten at a furious rate and did not regenerate. Large animals and small began to disappear from the park. In an effort to stem the loss, the park rangers began to kill predators, which they did without public knowledge. Here's a ranger in 1927 with wolf cubs, a very cute picture. Um, this is a result of the policy of going into wolf dens and killing all the animals and, and wiping out the entire den. Shooting cougar. They eliminated the wolf and the cougar, and they were well on their way to getting rid of the coyote. Then a national scandal broke out. New studies showed that it wasn't predators that were killing the other animals. It was overgrazing from too many elk. The management policy of killing predators, therefore, had only made things worse. Actually, the elk had so decimated the aspen that, that now, for formerly they were plentiful, now they're quite rare. Here you see them protected in a little stand. Without the aspen, the beaver, which used these trees to make dams, began to disappear from the park. Beaver were essential to the water management of Yellowstone, and without dams, the meadows dried hard in summer, and still more animals vanished. The situation worsened further. It became increasingly inconvenient that all the predators had been killed off by 1930. So in the 1960s, there was a sigh of relief when new sightings by rangers suggested that wolves were returning. Of course, there were rumors all during that time, persistent rumors that the rangers were trucking them in. But in any case, the wolves vanished soon afterward. They needed to eat beaver and other small rodents, and the beaver had gone. Pretty soon, the Park Service initiated a PR campaign to prove that excessive elk were not responsible for the problems in the park, even though they were. The campaign went on for about a decade, during which time the bighorn sheep virtually disappeared. Now we're in the 1970s, and bears were recognized as a growing problem. They used to be considered fun-loving creatures, and their close association with human beings was encouraged in the park. Here's people uh, coming to watch bear feedings as a, as a uh, show at a certain hour of the day. And here's one of my favorites, setting the table for bears at Lake Camp in Yellowstone Park. You see they're very well behaved. But that didn't actually continue. And now it seemed that there were the good behavior, I mean, there were more bears, and certainly there were many more lawyers, and thus the much increased threat of litigation. So the rangers moved the grizzlies out. The grizzlies promptly became endangered. Their formerly growing numbers shrank. The Park Service refused to let scientists study them, but once they were declared endangered, the scientists could go back in again. And by now, we're about ready to reap the rewards of our 40-year policy of fire suppression, Smokey the Bear, and all that. The Indians used to burn forest regularly, and lightning causes natural fires every year. But when these are suppressed, branches fall from the trees to the ground and accumulate over the years to make a, a dense ground cover such that, that when there is a fire, it is a very low, very hot fire that sterilizes the soil. In 1988, Yellowstone burned. And all 1.2 million acres were scorched, and 800,000 acres, one-third of the park, burned. Then, having killed the wolves, having tried to sneak them back in, they officially brought the wolves back. And now the local ranchers screamed. But newer reports suggest that the wolves seem to be eating enough of the elk that slowly the ecology of the park is being restored. Or so it is claimed. It's been claimed before. And on and on. As the story unfolds, it becomes increasingly impossible to overlook the cold truth that when it comes to managing 2.2 million acres of wilderness, nobody since the Indians has the faintest idea how to do it. And nobody asked the Indians because the Indians managed the land very aggressively, very intrusively. The Indians started fires regularly. They burned trees and grasses. They hunted the large animals, elk and moose, to the edge of extinction. White men refused to do that and made things worse. To solve that embarrassment, everybody pretended that the Indians had never altered the landscape. 
These pioneer ecologists, as Stuart Udall once called them, did not manipulate the land. But now, in recent years, the wisdom of Indian land management policies is increasingly difficult to cover up. All right, if we're going to do better in this new century, what must we do differently? What is the story of Yellowstone really telling us? I would argue that in a, in, a, in a phrase, we must embrace complexity theory. We must understand complex systems. We live in a world of complex systems. The environment is a complex system. The government is a complex system. Financial markets are complex systems. The human mind is a complex system. Most minds, anyway. By a complex system, I mean one in which the elements of the system interact among themselves such that any modification we make to the system will produce results that we can't predict in advance. In addition, a complex system is sensitive to initial conditions. You can get one result from it on one day, but the identical interaction the next day will yield a different result. We cannot know with certainty how the system will respond. Third, when we do something to a complex system, we may get downstream consequences that emerge weeks or even years later. We have to be watchful for delayed and untoward consequences. The science that underlies our understanding of complex systems is now 30 years old. A third of a century is plenty of time for this knowledge to filter down to everyday consciousness, but except for slogans like the butterfly flapping its wings and causing a hurricane halfway around the world, not much has really penetrated general human thinking. On the other hand, complexity theory has raced through the financial world. It has been briskly incorporated into medicine. But organizations that care for the environment don't seem to notice that their ministrations are often deleterious in many cases. Lawmakers don't seem to notice when their laws have unexpected consequences. Or maybe they notice, but they don't want to notice. Governors and mayors and managers may manage their complex systems well or badly. But if they manage well, it is usually because they have an instinctive understanding of how to deal with complex systems. Other managers fail. Why? Our human predisposition is to treat all systems as linear when they're not. A linear system is a rocket flying to Mars or a cannonball fired from a cannon. Its behavior is quite easily described mathematically. A complex system is water flowing over rocks or air flowing over a bird's wing. The mathematics are complicated and in fact no understanding of these systems was possible until the widespread availability of computers. One complex system that most people have dealt with is a child. If so, you've probably experienced that when you give the child an instruction, you can't be certain what the response will be, <laughs> especially if the child is a teenager. And similarly, you can't be sure that an identical interaction on another day won't have a spectacularly different outcome. So if you have a teenager or if you invest in the stock market, you know that a complex system cannot be controlled, it can only be managed. Because its behavior cannot be predicted, it can only be observed and responded to. An important feature of complex systems is that we don't know how they work. We don't, un we don't understand them.